This is part 10 in our series of lectures on infinite sets. In this lecture, we're going to give an application of the Kanner Schroeder Bernstein theorem. Namely, we're going to prove that R2 and R have exactly the same cardinalities. So here's a statement of the theorem R cross R and R have the same cardinalities. I think of all of the things that we've done in this course, this is the most surprising and maybe even the hardest to believe of everything that we've done. Uh, but nevertheless, the theorem is true. It really does say that if you look in the xy plane, and then just look at the x-axis, the points in the x-axis are in one-to-one -one correspondence with all of the points in the entire xy plane. I'm not going to write down uh, the formal proof of it, but I will show you what all of the main steps are. So now recall that we found um, very easily, just by drawing the right graph, that um, R and 0, 1 have the same cardinality. Recall also that we proved in an exercise that if we have four sets A through D, and if A and C have the same cardinalities, and if B and D have the same cardinalities, then the Cartesian products A cross B and C cross D also have the same cardinalities. And that means that it follows that R cross R and 0, 1 cross 0, 1 have the same cardinality. And so if we were able to prove that these two, 0, 1 cross 0, 1 and 0, 1 have the same cardinalities, and, of course, we know this one. Therefore, by transitivity, we would have the result that R cross R and R have the same uh, cardinalities. So that means that the only thing that remains to be shown is that 0, 1 cross 0, 1 and 0, 1 have the same cardinality. We're going to do it by making use of the kanner schroeder bernstein theorem, and that means that it's enough for us to produce an injection from 0, 1 cross 0, 1 into 0, 1, and an injection from 0, 1 into 0, 1 cross 0, 1. And um, if we can do that, then the, the theorem will guarantee that there really is a bijection, even though it won't tell us how to find out explicitly what that bijection is. But the point of the theorem, the reason the theorem is so great, is that it's really easy to write down, it's fairly easy to write down injections. Now, one of these injections is really easy to get. It's very easy to map 0, 1 into the product. We just simply map x to x comma 1 half. That's just one way we could do it. There are lots of ways we could do it, and it's easy to see that that's an injection. The hard one is to map um, the Cartesian product into 0, 1. That's the one that takes a, a clever trick to do. So for that purpose, for each x and 0, 1, we're going to represent it by means of a decimal expansion, and in order to make the digits of the decimal expansion unique, we're going to make sure that we don't allow an infinite string of nines, which is to say, we're not going to allow it to be the case that from some point on, all of the decimal digits are nine. Now here's the clever trick that we use. Given uh, an ordered pair x, y in 0, 1 cross 0, 1, and so we're going to represent, using this obvious notation, the decimal expansions of each of x and y. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to intersperse, I'm going to create a new decimal expansion by interspersing, alternatively, the digits of each of the x's and y's. So you see I've got x1, then y1, then x2, then y2, etc. That then creates a number in 0, 1, and so that gives us a mapping um, that maps certainly into 0, 1. Now, it's quite easy to see that the resulting function g is injective. So to see that, let's give ourselves two elements of the domain, and I've used this obvious notation of uh, writing their decimal expansions out. And uh, let's assume that the g values are the same, and that means that um, when I, alt I create this new decimal by alternating the digits of the expansions of x and y, and also of z and w, so to say that these are equal is to say that these decimal expansions are equal, but since we didn't have any infinite string of nines in any of the four expansions, then it's impossible for either of these expansions to have an infinite string of nines, at least nines from some point on. 
and therefore the decimal, the corresponding decimal digits must be identical. X1 must be Z1, Y1 must be W1, etc. That then forces X to be equal to Z and Y equal to W, and therefore G is injective, and so by the Kanner Schroeder Bernstein theorem, uh, the proof is complete. We've managed to find injections going both ways. Now note in the proof, uh, I haven't explicitly shown you a bijection. Neither F nor G is a surjection. It's easy to see that the range of F is um, it's just the set of all things of the form X comma a half as X varies over 0, 1, and that clearly occupies a very small part of the Cartesian product, 0, 1 cross 0, 1. So F is certainly not a surjection. But G isn't a surjection either because, for example, if I take this one here, so I, I could write down anything with, which has the property that after a while, every second digit is a 9. Because if I do that, say for this one, the, the only um, XY for which G of XY could equal this would be an X that looks like that. This would have to be Y, because that's the only way you can alternate these to produce that. But the catch is we haven't allowed a representation of any number in our, in our uh, 0, 1 to look like that, because there we have the infinite string of 9s. And therefore, this isn't in the range. So in fact, there are lots and lots of things uh, with the property that after a while every other digit is a 9. Um, so there are lots of things um, that are not in the range of this function. So G isn't even close to being surjective either. But you see, it doesn't matter that F and G aren't surjective. The point is it was fairly easy for us to come up with these injections, and it's the Kanner schroeder bernstein theorem that does the work for us. It, it supplies the bijection, even though it doesn't tell us exactly what it is.